It's my nerd world of Star Wars show. And on this week's episode, it's actually me on somebody else's show. A conversation about Star Wars and my Embark science fiction series with Star Wars Santa. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. And welcome to it, a Star Wars show. I am your host, John Justice. Thank you so much for checking out another episode. Now, this is a very special episode. We're doing something a little bit different. Uh, Star Wars Santa, he is another uh, Star Wars commentator, hosts a uh, YouTube show. I highly encourage you to go and check it out. Uh, He has been kind enough to invite me on his show this week. And with that, he's been reading my Embark Science Fiction Space Opera series. So this week, you're going to be spared at the end of the episode all of my Star Wars, uh, my Embark pitches, as I typically do, because I spend a good chunk of the beginning of our conversation talking about my Embark books. And I don't get interviewed very often about my uh, about my stories. So if you're unfamiliar, this is a good opportunity. But this the story revolves around Star Wars and my inspiration of George Lucas. And how I got into it before we get into a conversation um, about Star Wars, uh, what uh, is happening within the fandom, and uh, also where Star Wars is uh, heading in the future. So, uh, with that, here is my conversation (laughs) on uh, my nerd world, a Star Wars show with Star Wars Santa. I really hope that you enjoy it. This is not going to go you think well hello john it's good to meet you uh, i've been reading your books and i had some questions i'm so thankful you give me some time to talk about your book and to start and uh and talk about star wars so uh, uh first of all just hello well thank you. you so you know listen thank you so much for for having me on you know the the books were kind of um kind of an experiment we can get into that and uh i don't get interviewed about them often so i am more than happy to to talk about the books and of course always more than happy to to talk about star wars so uh, and again thank you so much for having me on the show man i really appreciate it oh wonderful so first of all just for people who don't know what embark is you do a great intro all the time about your books tell folks who are listening to me and maybe haven't heard that what what are these books about in general so the the quick um, description for for the first book in the series is uh, after Earth faces its end, follow pilots Taft, Katha, and their crew on a journey of survival across the galaxy as they fight for their future among the stars. Um, it is a space opera series. The first book is really kind of a mashup of all the different genres that I love. And um, I won't get too far ahead and uh, of, of whatever questions you have, but it really, I wanted the first book. The first book was if I were going to the movie theater and it wasn't a Star Wars film, what movie would I want to go see? And the first book's a, a, it's a bit challenging, I think, for an introduction to a lot of sort of traditional space opera fans because it really does have sort of a, a post-apocalyptic disaster vibe, survival vibe to it before you get to the end and you transition into the rest of the series, which becomes more of a traditional sort of space opera uh, that people would be would be used to. But that was the original idea. I was inspired by George Lucas, and we can get into that, but... I really wanted to create something that that I would want to read, that I would want to go watch on the big screen, and it really it's a combination of all the different genres I love, including going back to um, those romantic comedies 
um, those coming of age films like Say Anything when I was growing up as a as a kid. I I wanted to have a, a a bit of a vibe in there as well and a little bit of a nod to say Ready Player One with some of the musical um, so the the music Easter eggs and, and that I put in the story as well. That's great. And so just uh, I'm I'm in the middle of the second book. And during the first book, I started thinking like, wow, this guy's thought about a lot of things I think about. Uh, one of them, one of the first things, and this won't be too spoilery, but it, it's essentially mankind has kind of moved beyond driving around on roads. Uh, there's a, a lot of train. Uh, uh, people get along by flying here mm-hmm. and there, right? And they've got personal vehicles that are uh, uh, able to fly with technology that doesn't exist as we know it, but sure. it's, uh, technology allows them to move around. So these are things that I, I think people have been thinking about for a long time. Like, when are we getting into flying cars? Right? Like, uh, people have been saying that since I think there was a World Fair back in like the 20s or something like that, where the concept of flying cars and people would be moving around in the air uh, in the future. And it occurs to me, I mean, one of the things I think about with that is the logistics of people you know you've you've driven in commuter traffic i cannot imagine like you watch the jetsons right and they're they're, (laughs) right they're flirting around it comes time to you know off board and they just go you know to their house and they dock at their house and all that in real life we can't manage on a you know on a flat plane to not run into each other you can go in the same direction Right. We're all going the same direction right. on the same flat plane on an interstate. But yet every day people manage to ruin it. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think about, wow, this commuting in cars thing is a great idea. Uh, and d- just what led you to explore that further and to actually put it as part of the book? It works out great as a, a vehicle to get to where we're headed sure but but just the idea of okay mankind's moved beyond moving around in cars and did you ever think about those kind of things like how do we not run into each other well it's funny because i thought about it more afterwards like now whenever i drive around after writing the stories like i i suddenly notice all the blank space <laughs> Like, I'm like, wow, we don't utilize, like, if you're near a downtown, it's one thing. But when you're just driving, especially here in Minnesota, like, I'm driving around going, we just, there's so much space that we just simply do not utilize at all as a, as a, as a species yet. Right. Um, yeah. So I, when I wrote the story, uh, I wanted to, and I'll, and I'll sort of, I'll try to keep a short path here, but I, I kind of feel like I need to add this beginning part. Um, you know, I was inspired by George Lucas. I wanted to know what it was like to create my own world, but I also didn't want to do something that was more derivative of what you typically see uh, in space operas of, you know, in, in a in a far-off galaxy completely separate from Earth. I, I wanted to ground it in Earth, so I set it in the future. And I was really driven by, one, like George was inspired by Flash Gordon, I was inspired by George, and I definitely wanted to focus on technology and machines and to have my own version of like the millennium Falcon and X-wing fighters and, and, and tie fighters. And so I thought, all right, I'll set it in the future. And my inspiration was fast and furious because in my mind, when I started the story, I kind of had this vision of fast and furious set in the future as, you know, going into a space opera where, Every, you know, the kids no longer, it's, I have a relationship with my car. I have a 2014 Kia Forte Coupe two-door that I should not love the way that I do. But I love that car. And as a matter of fact, I sent that photos of my car to the artist who did the covers for my book and said, base the main character's ship (laughs) off of, as much off of my car as you can. And on the cover there, it's the ship, if you're staring at the cover, it's the ship off to the the right, if you're looking at it. Um, And so the idea was, you know, flight culture has replaced car culture, where kids love their vehicles 
mm-hmm. as much as you know they did in Fast and Furious. And there's some elements in there where I made them customizable, and I had an idea yeah. of of making everything to be able to be interchangeable. And it's in the book. I moved away from it a little bit later on as the story grew. These are just kind of some things that I saw I thought were cool. But that's where the mm-hmm. initial idea came from. What it was almost like this. You know, fast and furious in the future, but the you know these are now flying cars. I call them traverse crafts or T crafts. That's where the initial idea uh, came from, and I actually used that in the marketing from the start. I don't anymore because I think it's to the book's detriment. Because I think people go space opera, fast and furious. What the heck are you talking about? It's a movie. I don't oh. get it. So I I ditched that idea in terms of promotion. But that's where the idea came from. I see. Well, you know, George was really into car culture as well, right? And. and- famously he got really injured which kind of ended some of his plans but set him on a different trajectory in life which has given us star wars it's fantastic so the, the i love it there's another part that the book kind of starts off centered around phoenix arizona area mm-hmm. now i know you live in minnesota now what drew you to set the book in phoenix i was living there when i started the book so i i was doing a show in tucson and i was there for eight years before coming up here to minnesota so when i had initially started the book i had started writing it down in in arizona and then i think i finished it within at least the first two years since i got up here to 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 Minnesota but yeah that's why so and I was born and raised in I was born and raised in Southern California and then I bounced back and forth from Arizona for a couple of years met my wife when I was working for the rock station before I came back and worked for the talk station so um I just have a really close relationship with that state from living there before it's it's, it's wonderful my wife and I had planned on retiring to Arizona like so many old people do <laughs> so we were we were just going to do that but we actually fell in love with phoenix uh when we were much younger we've traveled out there for vacations we've got friends who are there um the company my wife works for i worked for as well we had uh branch offices there and so we would travel there for business we would travel there on vacations uh we absolutely love phoenix and uh we have friends who lived in Tucson. We went down and visited them, and uh, we like to 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 go there to vacation, go up to Flagstaff, and yeah, it's beautiful. Just, we love the state. We we really do. And uh, just life changed, so our plans changed. My mom passed, and my dad's a widower, and my brothers have moved off, and we feel a responsibility um, to be here for him so that he can live uh, the life he wants to live um safely so uh so i was just fascinated by it and i keep hearing these locations that i've been to or you know yeah every location in the book is something that i have some sort of connection to so i can just well, say that up front yeah and yeah on earth on yeah earth. yeah on earth right i was just thinking about that i was like oh yeah well yes and no and you'll find out later but Okay. When you, when okay. you get when you, when when and when and hopefully you get to book 4 which is probably my favorite in the series um oh, wow. then we can have another discussion again and you'll know exactly what i'm talking about and if when when, when you get to that spot but well i i see very very strong connections to star wars throughout it um there's the the ship that they go find on the moon mm-hmm. and i don't want to give away too much because uh, i've gotten into the second book and some things there as well and, and a lot of the story still is left for to unfold for me but they find this ship on the moon Mm -hmm. and it's a legendary ship. Right. In my head, I'm thinking, Oh, this is sort of like the Falcon. Yep. Except it's bigger. Right. Yeah. The anniversary. Yeah. The end. It's, it's called the anniversary. And I don't even, my guess is I was probably riding that right around when my wife and I were having an anniversary. I think that's what it oh. was. I just I thought it was an interesting name for a ship. But yes, I mean that that ship in my mind was um was intended to be sort of the Millennium Falcon of the of the story and it plays a role um throughout the remaining books uh, in the uh, in the series. It is bigger because I needed to make it capable of housing 
the the tea crafts of the main characters and so i upscaled right. it from something that you would see you know in the millennium falcon but yeah that was you know i yeah i, I un, 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 uh, no shame whatsoever in 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 that ship being uh i wanted that to be the hero vehicle of the uh, of the story well it felt like it when i was reading it and then i'm like what wait this thing it's essentially to to folks who haven't read or that know star wars it's like a millennium falcon big enough to have x wings uh docked in yeah two or three x wings in there i'm like oh it's bigger it's a little bit different but uh it had the same sort of personality same sort of um draw for the characters Mm -hmm. that the falcon did and to me right away it felt like that and i'm reading about it and i'm like oh this is it to me it's a it's like comfort food right this is great it's a different different chain same same idea right burgers like it fries it's just done differently and it's it's wonderful i've i've really enjoyed it and there's a another aspect that i thought was great um the yellowstone uh super volcano Mm -hmm. idea right and this has been around people i see it on come up from time to time where should that ever actually erupt as a super volcano it could take out uh majority of life on the planet uh certainly not all life but sure it would it would send us into a um bit of a volcanic winter for quite a while and it would it would decimate life for hundreds and hundreds of miles in every, in every direction so uh there's an event that takes place and this super volcano goes off other kind of things happen all around it you mentioned how it's sort of a a, an, a post-apocalyptic well this is the thing that kind of sets it all off we've got this uh, super volcano we've got some other political geopolitical uh forces that will at work and uh these kids i think i'm those kids i'm an old yeah. man but, uh, these kids who are in like arizona um uh, kind of by their passion for what they do and uh, the culture that they live in managed to escape and the book kind of jettisons off from there. Mm-hmm. The series kind of takes off from there. And then you got their main characters. And um, I tell you, I'm in the middle of book two and uh, I'm like, Oh, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading last night. I went through several chapters like back to back to back. Cause I couldn't stop. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing John tomorrow. If he does something bad, I'm going to, I'm going to say, no, but... <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> it's I'm, been, been good. It means the world to me that you're, that, that you're enjoying them. And what I tell everybody too, is, you know, book one, book one was, it was a challenge to myself. I've always been horrible writing. I've just been a horrible writer. When I first started working in radio, when we started doing blogs um, back when they were a thing, my producer, who ended up becoming my best friend, um, he'd have to go in and rewrite them and basically sort of interpret what I was trying to say in this blog for my radio show because I kind of write like I talk. And I never in a million years thought I would write a, write a novel. And I just decided to to challenge myself. Um, and it was supposed to be one book. That was it. This was sort of be, this is going to be my, like this, this is my, this is my space opera. This is my opus, whatever, um, whatever comes of it comes of it. And I really had such a good time enjoying it. I'd always thought about an original trilogy and subsequently turned into seven books in all. Um, but when I got done writing it, I just, I really, it just thoroughly enjoyed the process that I decided to keep writing the, to keep writing the stories. And like everybody says, um, who writes that it becomes easier with every single, with every single book, that first book. I mean, I've got reams of paper and my wife edited the first one by hand and we've been able to sort of trim down the process since then. Um, I'll, I'll say this though, and it's not a spoiler because the whole purpose of the first book is really just to get everybody off the planet and out into space. That was the goal. Right. Um, Right. It was, there's a, there's a, I don't want anybody ever thinking that it's hard sci-fi. It's not hard sci-fi by any stretch. There's a, there's a fantasy element to it. You kind of just have to accept that this is the, the, the these are the rules of the world that I've created, even though it's essentially in the in the real world. But it was funny because when I was when I was writing the story, you mentioned Yellowstone going up, and that has a close 
um, tie to me. My father, it's like his favorite place on earth is Yellowstone. And um, we ended up going there for a family uh, family gathering a couple of years back. And I think I was actually in the middle of wrapping the book up. and Or I was in the middle of writing the book when we went. And in my mind, I just envisioned so much of Yellowstone with my ships flying through them. But I'll tell you, when it came to d- destroying Earth, I really... As the story unfolds, and probably now knowing this in retrospect, it makes more sense. But, you know, things progressively get worse and worse and worse. They got worse and worse and worse because I realized that I wasn't doing enough damage (laughs) to justify getting everybody off the planet. So I'm like, how do I really just take out the planet? Because it's not going to be enough just for Yellowstone going off. And you know what transpires in there. That was more out of necessity than it was anything else. And I thought it, I thought it, I, I thought it worked out the way that it, it was, it, the way that it was supposed to. It did. It has a nice little tie in to indoor, if I would say, mm-hmm. uh, but in my own mind. Sure. Right? Like I, I, I see how all that ties in. So, uh, look, I hope that folks, and I, I happen to know one of my close friends, once I mentioned I was reading this and uh, I was doing interviewing you, he went out and got them on Amazon as well. So oh, nice. I hope uh, folks here uh, take a chance to uh, read uh, these books, at least get into the first one, see if it's for you. I've enjoyed them uh, so far. I'm looking forward to seeing how it unfolds. And uh, it's it's a great time in between star Wars things, you have something on the side to pick up and read. And, uh, I, I look, it's good. I mean, I'm, I'm having fun. Now, another point just for other folks is these are available not only in hard, well, paperback, uh, they're also available on Kindle mm-hmm. and, uh, y- you did the audiobook versions of them. Yeah. Probably to my detriment, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, so when I, um, I'd always planned on doing audiobooks and you can you can through ACX which is the Amazon platform to put out when you self publish um it, it they make it really easy to go and hire voice actors professionals to go and to, to go and narrate the books and you can do like profit yeah. sharing and you can get people um I would say relatively cheap uh it, to to go and narrate and I had considered doing that but I thought well you know what the majority of people that I'm going to be able to reach being a self-published author and never having written anything before is going to be my radio audience. So mm. the best thing I thought at the time, the best thing for me to do would be for me to go and voice it because people are already familiar with me. Now, at the time when I did that, I didn't think about the fact that um, news talk show listeners may not all be science fiction fans. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, you know, in retrospect, I almost wish, and I've considered going back and hiring a voice actor to go and do it because I just do a passable job, and it's a lot of work to produce the 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 audiobooks. I mean, the audiobooks. Well, I, yeah, I that I was could only imagine. Yeah, hours like, I, upon hours of just reading and editing, and and I ended up doing all seven books in the series. But I'll tell you what, by the time I got to book seven, Battle Planet, I'm like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun though. It was I'm, fun. I I uh I bought a uh, a tele uh prompter okay. just for that reason because it's uh doing some of my Santa Claus work people want me to read stories and whatnot and I'm like I can't memorize this stuff I need to be able to be able to read uh while making eye contact and the teleprompter has really helped me with that but uh and I have a friend that I I used to work with uh, still a good friend of mine who is now doing voiceover stuff. He does commercials, television, all kinds of things. He's got a wonderful voice. And I'm like, okay, if I were to ever do that, I would call my friend Ron and say, hey, Ron, how would you like to read some stuff for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it, it's it's good. Because it, I know not everybody reads, not, uh, but the audio format works really well if you're uh, – commuting you're out riding the lawnmower whatever it is well and thank still have something yeah and thankfully um you know i I, i've I've had a the reviews on have been okay in terms of the audiobook Uh, i actually expected them to be a lot worse it's it's tough though i i the whole process when i wrote these books and 
I use the same process when I did the audio book is I kind of just, I kind of just taught myself. I listened to, I've never taken any writing courses. I should probably shouldn't tell anybody that I've never taken any creative writing courses at all. Um, you know, it was really just what I had personally read. And then I kind of just taught myself, you know, how all of this was, you know, how I'm supposed to format the book and audiobook was the same thing. I was going back and listening to other voice actors and all that. Because you really got to kind of ham it up to really make it work, and I don't think I ham yeah. it up. I, I don't think I ham it up nearly as much as I uh, as I as I could. But um, well, there's only one thing I would criticize you on, and it's a it's it's a pet peeve of mine. And mm-hmm. it's, I'll, I'll make I'll make my my family crazy about it. it's when you abbreviate something and then say one of the words that's in the abbreviation. Oh, okay. So, so one thing you do consistently, and every time you do it, I'm like, ah, <laughs> it's just from a fun way. I'm sure. not like it's uh, OS, right? It's an operating system, right? This thing's got an OS. That's got an OS, right? My computer has an OS. My watch has an OS, right? But you you consistently say OS system. Oh, like, oh that's oh. a good point. There's a wow. Yeah. All right, she did this on her OS system. Yeah, like, of course it was. No, <laughs> it's kind of like saying it's kind of like saying a hot water heater. It's just a water heater. It's not a hot water heater. It's just a water heater. That's good. You know what? I may. You know what? I it, I I may go and fix that just because you said it. I've become <laughs> I've I've become very adept of going in and re-editing my book when people point out things. Well, and I'll give you one because the version you got is the most updated. Well, it's pretty. Well, anyway. Well, because I just recently I over the course of the past month I rewrote the prologue. Okay, I compl- no, I, I don't have the revised prologue. I completely rewrote the prologue. It actually turns into – because your version of the prologue is still the radio host, right, explaining yes. everything? Okay. Yes. That was initially in the book. It was a – I had the I, – I wanted to do exposition, but I knew that I didn't want to do info dumps t- traditionally. So I had originally gone and made it so the characters when they were flying were listening to the podcast and that's oh, when yeah. you would get that's when you would get the info dump. I but see. what what I found out at the beginning was it was dramatically slowing the story down. Mm-hmm. So I I removed all of it and I put it into the prologue and I've actually trimmed that down quite a bit. And then over the course of the last month I actually went and com- I, it's the same intro but it ends up turning into a uh, into an action sequence and so I see. but the first, you'll appreciate this, and this can help us transition to Star Wars, and we can stop talking about me. Um, <laughs> when I first wrote the story, again, being inspired by George Lucas, and I wanted to have something of an element of the Force without doing that because I'm, it's in the real world. And so early on in the book, I talk about how Religion has gotten a little bit more homogenized, right? Mm-hmm. And I've actually had people complain to me. They say I killed off Christianity, and that was completely the opposite of what my intention was. Um, I, I didn't feel like re- I did that. I did that at all. It reminded me of the Left Behind books. If you okay, read those. Yeah. So what I wanted was I wanted something. I wanted sort of a a comparison to uh, May the Force Be With You, and so. Yeah. I believe in 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 my life that everything happens for a reason. And so yeah. that was the impetus in the book for the for a reason. Well, yeah. the version you so the version now that you get it's not mentioned a ton. The original version it was in there like 65 times. Oh. So I actually had to go and remove it out because it was just overkill and I needed to and I so I'm just going back to what you said I had somebody point that out and I didn't realize it, and I did a quick search through the document and I just typed it for a reason and it was like 65 occurrences I'm like oh my gosh so I had to go back there and change it <laughs> well every time uh, I hear an abbreviation I hear the words right OS operating system and it says operating system system yeah no nope. okay all right, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a note. I'm gonna make that change. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, no, Out of all the criticism I, I can get, I'll take that one. <laughs> it's fun. I I look. I I don't want anybody to to think I'm critical at all. I'm oh goodness, no. These books, and I'm looking forward to uh, to continuing the journey because right now I'm a little worried about a couple of things, and I'm like, oh, I've got to. I've got to see how this uh, plays out. So um, thank you for that. So well, I had yeah, my, we I, wanted to. I had my my uh, there was a there's a character in the first book and you know who I'm talking about that uh, 
that doesn't make it. Not a spoiler, but there's a character that there's one specific character that doesn't make it. And uh, I had at the time when he read it, I think he was 11 or 12. My my youngest, Kyle, um, he was very upset with me. He was very, very mad when that happened because that was his favorite character. So he was, I think, you know who I'm talking about. And yeah, yeah. he was, he, oh, he did yeah. not, I, he was mad at me for like a month after he read that. Oh, really? Yeah. He was so, so ticked off. So, oh, well, I'm excited God. to hear your thoughts of Treasure in Darkness. The triad was probably some of my favorite characters to write, my three assassins from that book. And so, uh, well, I'll, I'll stay in touch as I work my way through for sure. Cool. Uh, so, so these are heavily influenced by Star Wars. Mm-hmm. I think it doesn't take a leap for a Star Wars fan to make the connections like I did between the anniversary and the Falcon. I think a lot of people will see those threads throughout. Uh, and the the inspiration George Lucas has made. I fell in love with Star Wars back in 1977. It was the summer of my 10th birthday. I was born in July. So uh, I got to see that movie that summer. And uh, that opening sequence just changed my life right yep. like it was so mind-blowing and it's hard to describe to the, the kids growing up today or younger generations just the transformation that was before that movie and the next day like the like cinematography changed that fast it was mind-blowing it was so big like that distra- that star destroyer as it as it just keeps coming, keeps coming, it's bigger and bigger. It goes well beyond anything that I could have even thought of. Right, the Tandem Four goes by. That's a big spaceship. It's like that's a big spaceship, and then this other one comes and it's magnitudes larger. Sure, I was captured from that moment on. Right, there are things about Star Wars that have made me crazy over the years, and the prequels are. I'm high among those, but uh, there's the, some of the decisions George made between uh, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, for example. I, I'm like, mm, shouldn't have done that. But I love this. I love the fantasy aspect. I'm more of a fantasy kind of guy, anyway. Mm-hmm. You you add it. You you accurately said your books are more sci-fi than he is, but they're not completely science fiction either. Right. Um, there's some parts of it that you're like, how would that work? No, it wouldn't. Yeah. Right. But no. <laughs> no. My idea is my, everybody. If 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 everybody traveled through space the way my characters do, nobody is traveling t- through space the way my characters do because they all die. So that right. it's just it's just, it's just <laughs> the sheer physics of it makes no sense whatsoever. But and I am I have I have no problem admitting that whatsoever. It is no. Not it's the, fine. It is not exactly. the expanse by any stretch. <laughs> No, it's the same way with with hyperspace travel in in Star Wars. Sure, right? like yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense, but it's fine. Uh, Could you just let that go? That's not. Yeah, it's just how they get from here to there. Uh, so I'm just curious. I told you, episode four, Star Wars. That's mm-hmm. that's began my love affair. I had this this rocky bit with the prequels, uh, and since Disney uh, purchase, I've been largely. A happy Star Wars fan. Mm-hmm. Um, not don't, not in love with everything in every show, but I would say every show, every movie that has been released under the Disney era has brought me some form of entertainment in Star Wars that gives me some happiness. So um, wh- where's your journey starting? How are how are you doing with it? In, in, in incredibly similar to to yours. So um, I saw. I was also born in July. I'm July eighth. I don't know about you. Twenty second. Okay. So um, my father. I was five years old at the time. Uh, he took me to go see uh, A New Hope when it first came out, and it, I mean, my experience mi- mirrored yours. Um, I can still. I mean, even at five years old, I still can see the inside of the theater. Um, I was able to actually find a photograph that somebody had taken of the theater wow. in Rosemead, California, outside the around the era of when I saw it for the first time. And um, I can still, you know, the screens were a lot smaller back then, depending on which theater that you were, right, you were in. I still remember seeing the, the, uh, the trench run for the first time. And um, I became a fan of Star Wars, really, before I was a fan of anything else in my 
you know, in, in my life. And it sparked a love affair with science fiction like it did for, you know, for everybody. And um, I still remember going out and seeing Empire and Return of the Jedi with my dad for the first time. Going out to Hollywood for the premiere of Return of the Jedi. And during the speeder bike chase, the film uh, fried. So you had oh, the, no. bur- the burn. The burn came up on the screen. <laughs> they had to shut it down and put it back together. I'll never forget that. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and listen, you know, I enjoyed the prequels. I, th- I think, um, you know, I... I'm a bit of a Star Wars apologist to a certain extent. Less so now that I've gotten older. I think um, I, I share similar views that you have. I, I love the the sequel trilogy. Um, I really enjoyed the prequels. I think I walked out of The Phantom Menace liking it more than I really... Saying that I liked it more than I did. Um, you know, walking out going, that was a Star Wars movie. It was great. And then in the back of my head going... Uh, there were some problems that I had with it because it just wasn't like the original trilogy, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I've grown, but but I've grown to love them, and I'm with you. There's some stuff that has been created since the sale that I've really enjoyed, and some stuff that I've had a harder time with. I think one of the Kenobi is probably the one series that I have the most trouble with. With I've thrown it on the background and watched it several times, but I just got a lot of issues with it. Um, but for the most part, I've enjoyed what they've created. I think they're in a rut right now. I can't believe it's been as long as we have since we've had a theatrical release. And but um, you know, I still love my I still love my Star Wars. I'm not upset that they did not going to do a season two of uh, of the Acolyte. I would have been fine if they did, but I'm not upset over it. So well, yeah, I I feel similarly. And it's funny you mentioned Phantom Menace because I came out of it like you, wanting to like it more than maybe I really did. Because there's some parts of that that I'm like, when I especially now when I rewatch it, like Three Stooges aren't in Star Wars. Maybe <laughs> right. the, the pit droids doing the Three Stooges with the nya nya nya. Right. Like, no, I don't need none of that. But <laughs> but but uh, it, it was Attack of the Clones that I just couldn't defend. Right? I defended Phantom Menace to like my friends at the time. They were like, that was not Star Wars. And I'm like, it was Star Wars. You shut up. Right. <laughs> um, but it, it leads me to the next thing I want to talk about is because we all have our own way of coming about it. And when I would argue with my friends about the Phantom Menace not being the worst Star Wars movie of, or you know, the worst abomination of Star Wars that ever existed, um, we would we would bicker about it, but we never really got mad at right. one another. Right? It didn't break any relationships. It didn't cause us to stop loving star wars or to, to uh talk about star wars we just had different opinions on these things and uh much as throughout my life uh i've i've differed with people politically religiously uh ideologically like on on major things in my life uh child rearing the values you have as a parent all of these kind of things and when it comes to star wars i can't like your opinions and my opinions are our opinions. And I, I have a hard time uh, with how things dialogue and discourse mm-hmm. now, especially online when people disagree and the acolytes a good one. Cause it's more, you know, now, even today, a man came out and said some stuff about some mm-hmm. alt-right people making I saw that. life bad. Right. Um, but then now, now we got to fight. Right. And I, I I have a hard time with that. Um, for me, these people aren't trying to make you mad. They're they're expressing themselves and their their opinions, their views, their ideologies. Um, and I have to I have to draw a line on is this something that's worth severing a relationship over because we disagree about something on TV? Right. Right. Well, and I think that anybody that I, I guess I, you know, anybody that would go and, and and sever a relationship over it, you know, I, you'd have to question whether or not that was, you know, how strong was that relationship, you know, in the first place. Um, I think there's been a great things that have come about because of social media, but I also think that as a species, we were never, we were never meant to be as tied in to each other as we are, um, in in the way that we can you can bring in so many different voices and and views on a certain thing. And again, there's positive things about it. I mean, you and I are talking today because of all these, you know, because of social media. So there certainly is positive things, but unfortunately, 
you know, you're right. When we were younger, we would debate these things, but then we would move on. There wasn't a need or a desire that it seems that so many people have to make sure that their opinion is val- is validated. Right. It's it was just, a, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll disagree. Ah, you're wrong. Whatever. Now let's go off and do, you know, whatever we want to do now right. because of social networking, there is this desire to have these opinions, you know, validated by so many different people. And then then it becomes a, a lucrative marketing aspect of it when it comes to YouTube channels and people go and post something online and then they're going to look to see, cause I've done it before and I've, you know, I've tried to be better about it, but you post something online and you think it's controversial and you go, well, who's agreeing with me? Who's disagreeing with me? You know, and it's a byproduct of the nature of what I do as a, as a talk show host. But when you're talking about average individuals and this is how they conduct all of their arguments and disagreements, it ends up just creating this almost like a mushroom cloud of dissent um, that, yeah kind of continues almost like you know to use the analogy it's almost like an explosion and it just continues to feed it to, to feed itself and it doesn't seem to be getting better anytime soon the acolyte i saw those same clips from amandala yesterday the same audio clips and and listen i i get it you know there was a lot of criticism and a lot of unnecessary criticism i'm not going to deny that but that's not the reason why the show got canceled. The show got canceled because people didn't watch it. You know, right. it, it, the, 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 the viewership dropped off after two episodes. And so regardless of the controversy, there were still a lot of people that were didn't hate it, that were still watching it. But for the mass audience, it didn't it didn't connect with them. And that's ultimately why that why that failed. Yeah, agree. And that, you know, you have influencers that they're, they're called influencers for a reason. Right. And people can talk about, well, did the influencers cause it to fail? But I think at the end of the day, it comes to eyeballs. And like, if I like something and I disagree with Star Wars theory about it, I'm still going to enjoy it. Or if I don't like something and he absolutely loves it, I'm not going to be like, I'm not, you know, I should like this because theory likes it. Like, Right. I'm an individual. I'm a grown adult. I can make my own decisions. But a lot of and... people feel that way. A lot of people base their views off of what it, what one person says without forming their own opinion. Exactly. Exactly. So I get the frustration. I had an emotional response as well, and I'm sad that it's not continuing. There's a lot of the story I want to finish. I, sure. Maybe I'll get it in a book. Maybe I'll get it in a uh, comic or something, right? Um, we're running a little bit short on time. I could talk to you all afternoon, but I do want to ask about the upcoming, there's, there's upcoming shows. The mm-hmm. skeleton crew is right around the corner. Yeah. Uh, it, it, for me, the Amblin side of it, ET Goonies is right there. I'm on board. I'm excited for it. How, how, what are you thinking? I'm I listen I'm excited for it too for the same reasons. Um I was a little taken aback by a lot of people when we saw the first footage of what looked like suburbia in Star Wars. But I think mm-hmm. it's just because we've never seen that before and it makes sense that it would that it would be there. I mean George drew from real world experiences. The whole reason why I think it was so successful was it was a lived in universe that we could all go and relate to even though it was a galaxy far far away. It made it made some sense even though you're talking about this fantasy world. And so Kind of going back to what we were just talking about and having our opinions influenced by things. I, unfortunately, even myself, I sometimes will just navigate towards what is it I don't like instead of going, okay, John, stop it. You know, mm-hmm. let's look at this yeah. and, t- and take it in. I'm excited for it. Um, I hope that I hope it's successful for Lucasfilm and Disney's sake. You know, I I, yeah. I, I think I'm with you. I want Star Wars to flourish. I want it to be successful. And I think it's got bogged down for a lot of different, you know, reasons. Um, I feel like there's some course correcting going on just within society in and of itself over some of the issues that has plagued some of these shows. I hope this is the first, you know, um, of what will be some successes. And um, I'm looking forward for what it can deliver. I'm excited that it's in the Mandoverse, too, because I really like what they've done with the Mandoverse um, yeah. wasn't the biggest fan of Book of Boba Fett, but I love Ahsoka. Really looking forward to Mandalorian and Grogu, and I like I I've got a lot of faith in Dave Filoni, and I know he wasn't necessarily a part of this, but I know it's going to be sort of sort of just adjacent to that, and so I'm I, I'm excited I'm excited for it, and for whatever the future I, brings for the films, whatever they're going to be. There you go. I, we'll have to talk more 
we'll have to do this again. But uh, yeah, I'm mostly worried about the fan interactions. The show, I feel like my own interaction with the show will probably be good. Sure. Just my own yeah. experience. And I look for whatever the storyteller is giving me. And I'll nitpick things here or there. But I'm I'm largely consuming the entertainment for that purpose. Uh, so I expect that myself, I'll, I'll like it to some degree more or less than something else. But I worry about some of this fandom. I worry about the discourse and people saying it's too goofy, it's too silly, it's too not Star Wars in fighting continuing, right? Like, yeah. I'm just so over it. And I want us to find something we get excited about. And uh, hopefully, Skeleton Crew is that. Hopefully, the Mando Grogu movie uh, gets a new name and it. <laughs> also does that for us. <laughs> uh, I don't know you, if you. I appreciate your time so much. And, yeah, man. Uh, it's so good to get to meet you, and hopefully, we'll continue this relationship going forward. Yeah. Now that we have it all worked out, uh, let's uh, you know, let's uh, let's do it again. I'm happy to come back on and uh, and talk more with you. Uh, and thank you so much for devoting so much time uh, to my uh, to my books. I'm. It's it's made my week that you're enjoying them, and uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to uh, sort of promote them beyond my own my own podcast as well. So thank you for the time uh, today, man. I really you're appreciate it. Welcome. All right. Well, as I always say to everybody at the end of my show, uh, you all have a wonderful day. And until next time, my friends, ho, 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 Merry Christmas, and may the Force be with you always. Bye-bye. I need someone. To show me my place in all this. And that was my conversation with Star Wars Santa. Again, I hope that you uh, you enjoyed it. Uh, definitely going to hook up with him again in the future. I seem to have found a bit of a kindred spirit in uh, our views of a galaxy far, far away. And with that, I'm actually going to wrap up the episode this week. Um, I'll tease a bit of what I have so far for next week's show. Some fans have deciphered a secret message within Ahsoka Season 1 relating to Season 2. Not a huge surprise. It relates to the, the the Mortis gods, the three gods, the father, the son, and the daughter. So on next week's episode, I'll get into the details on that. And also, I'll get to your listener feedback. I got um, a handful of emails over the course of the past week, and I want to make sure that I can give them uh, the necessary time and attention. But because of my truncated timeline this week, I'm going to hold off on the listener feedback. But if you have anything that you would like to add for next week's episode, always drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Or if you're enjoying the show up on YouTube, go and leave a comment. Uh, there and we'll talk about it on next week's show as i talked about with star wars santa and my stories if you would like to go and check out my uh, science fiction space opera series embark it is available at amazon.com just search for john uh, j-o-n uh, justice but thank you so much for checking out this week's episode i will be back again next week and as always i hope wherever you are you're happy you're healthy and you're safe i'll talk to you then bye the force will be with you Always. My Nerd Road. <laughs>